Good afternoon, everyone. Honored to be seated next to the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, the COVID-19 response medical advisor and former state epidemiologist, Dr. Eddie Bresnitz. Great to have you both. Uh, guy to my left needs no introduction, the superintendent of the state police, Colonel Pat Callahan. We have Jared Maples, director of the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, Paramount Guard, chief counsel, and a cast of thousands. This week marks Black Maternal Health Week, and with that, I want to salute all the hard work being undertaken by First Lady Tammy Murphy in partnership with our state departmental leaders, hospital and health care leaders, and community leaders and advocates, among so many others. Our goal, their goal and our goal, is nothing less than eradicating racial disparities in maternal health and making New Jersey the safest state in America to have a baby and to raise a child. So to all, we recognize all that you are doing and remain committed to working alongside of each of you. Now I must start by reiterating our announcement from yesterday of our decision to temporarily pause the administration of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine upon the recommendation of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Food and Drug Administration pending further investigation into six reported instances of severe blood clots following vaccinations. Now, for sure, these six cases each appear to be extremely rare and serious, as there, are, as there have been nearly 7 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine administered nationwide. And in New Jersey, where we had administered just over 244,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine prior to hitting pause, no similar adverse effects have been reported. Even with this pause, our overall goal of vaccinating 4.7 million adult New Jerseyans by the end of June remains not only in place, but entirely achievable. As of today, doses of Johnson & Johnson have accounted for only about 4%, Judy, of the more than 5.6 million total vaccine doses we have administered. I want to repeat that no one who has received this vaccine should panic or worry. This review by the CDC and the FDA is coming out of an abundance of caution. Moreover, this review is critical to our efforts, both statewide and nationwide, to ensure confidence in our vaccination program and in the vaccines themselves. I will ask if it's okay with her, Judy, to speak further to the work of the department in light of the CDC and FDA recommendation and how she and her team are working with our vaccination sites to assist those who were scheduled to receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But it bears repeating that there have not been any similar reported adverse effects with Johnson & Johnson's vaccine in New Jersey, nor have them been, by the way, from either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. This pause also has no effect on Monday's opening of vaccine eligibility to all New, Jersey, all New Jerseyans age 16 and over. We will keep pushing forward with the tools available to us. And again, I know that Judy will have more to say on this, and she and Dr. Bresnitz and I will answer your questions in a few moments, as we always do. Next up, uh, sw switching gears. I am proud to announce that through the American Rescue Plan, we are taking steps here to make health insurance more affordable for hundreds of thousands of New Jersey residents who purchase policies through our state-based exchange, Get Covered New Jersey. Because of the new savings available under the American Rescue Plan, the Department of Banking and Insurance, under Marlene Carita's great leadership, has reallocated some of the money we are providing for state subsidies to help more people. For the first time ever, state and federal subsidies will be provided to residents at higher income levels, and residents previously eligible for financial help under the Affordable Care Act will get even more savings. This new financial help will be available starting tomorrow at that website, getcovered.nj.gov. As we had previously announced, enrollment through Get Covered New Jersey is open through the end of the year. But the sooner you sign up, the sooner you have access to health coverage and the new savings available. If you are already involved, enrolled, you will likely be able to claim additional savings. If you need coverage, check out your options. And if you received unemployment compensation in 2021, you may be eligible for nearly free coverage. So again, please go to that website, getcovered.nj.gov, beginning tomorrow. 
Now, moving on, let's take a look at some of the numbers that we have coming in. First, on vaccinations, we are reporting today a total of 2,292,316 fully vaccinated individuals. The total number of doses administered by both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is just under 5.4 million. And the stability of their supply and distribution is why we remain confident of our ability to still meet our June 30th vaccination goals. We are reporting today an additional 3,786 reported positive cases. That's combining PCRs with presumed positive antigens. The statewide rate of transmission continues to trend, Judy, in the right direction. Downward, and today it is at a seven-day average of 0.92. The rate of positivity, on the other hand, of 24,396 PCR tests recorded on Saturday was 11.04 percent. That does not surprise us in the least. We've said this many times. The, 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 the positivity rate from Monday through Friday has been in the 7 to 8 percent range now for a couple of months. And sure enough, on weekends, because of fewer tests, people testing with an adverse selection, they don't feel well, um, uh, that it goes into the low double digits. We take it seriously, believe me, uh, but that is not surprising. Looking to our health care systems, last night there were a total of 2,281 patients being treated across our 71 hospitals, and this includes 2,140 who have already tested positive. Our intensive care units were treating 457 patients, and there were 254 ventilators in use. Throughout the day yesterday, 297 live patients were discharged while another 271 new positive COVID positive patients were admitted and our hospitals not yet confirmed, none of these are confirmed, reported 24 in hospital deaths. Uh, notwithstanding that they have not been confirmed, we are reporting an additional 43 confirmed losses of life due to COVID related uh, uh, complications uh, and that is with the heaviest of hearts. The number of probable deaths has been revised upward by a net number of 19 as we do every Wednesday, we revisit that. That's now 2,592, and these remain under investigation by Dr. Ed Lifshitz and his team at the Communicable Disease Service. I believe if you combine 22,414 and 2,592, you will note that we have crossed 25,000 losses of life, almost or beyond unfathomable. As we do every day, let's take a couple of minutes and remember several more of those we have lost. First up, we remember this guy, uh, a friend to human and four-legged creatures, Dr. Adel Hamdan, a veterinarian who was a longtime member of the Clifton community. Dr. Hamdan was 74 years old. He was born in Jerusalem and earned his degree in veterinary medicine from the University of Baghdad in 1972. Soon after, Dr. Hamdan made the decision to come to the United States and New Jersey, along with his brothers, Dean, a physics professor at Montclair State University, and oddly, an engineer and finance professor now in Jordan. At first, he couldn't practice veterinary medicine, but during breaks from his job at a grocery store, he prepared for his U.S. qualification exams, which he passed, and by 1976, he was heading his own practice in Maywood. He would later own and lead the Totowa Animal Hospital. Outside of his clinics, Dr. Hamden was a leader in the community, a past president of both the Maywood Rotary and the American Doctors Association of New Jersey. Besides his brothers, with whom he joined in, the, their, in their search of the American dream, Dr. Hamdan leaves behind his wife of the past 12 years, Alia, his children Adam and Nadia, and his grandson Richard. He's also survived by his sisters Abir, Aisha, Anbara, Awatif, and Aida, and many other relatives. <clears throat> and of course, he leaves behind many dear friends of both the two and four-legged variety. I spoke to Alia his wife on Monday night, because I had tried her a couple of times. She got back to me later. She's not a, a, a doctor, but she runs the veterinary hospital and ran it for Dr. Hamdan. And the reason she couldn't pick me up earlier, she was uh, accompanying the medical professionals making the rounds at the veterinary hospital. We are honored that Dr. Hamdan chose to make his home in New Jersey. May God bless him, and we thank him for his years of community service. Next up, we honor Cranford's John Grieve, that's John on the lower right, who we lost at the age of 86. A native of Garwood, 
John enlisted in the United States Air Force out of high school, serving as an airman first class during the Korean conflict and earning multiple military honors. Upon his return, he embarked on a three decades long career with Bell Telephone while also working on the side for Premier Electric and Garwood, compiling a total of more than 50 years there. He served as an active member of both the Cranford and Garwood first aid squads for over 30 years with notable time spent as both squad captain and president. John is survived by the four ladies standing uh, behind him, his daughters Cindy, Penny, Linda, and Katie, and their spouses, along with his nine grandchildren, Jessica, Carrie, John, Stephen, Luke, Emily, Ed, Holly, and Caitlin, and four great-grandchildren, Jackson, Bella, Avery, and Casey. He's also survived by his brothers Charles and William and his sister Dorothy and many nieces and nephews. I spoke with his daughter Penny on Monday uh, and had a, a really deep conversation about her dad and Penny herself is a first responder. So thank you Penny and to your sisters and the entire family there. We thank your dad for his service both to our nation and to his community and may God bless him watch over his memory and his tremendous family. And finally today we remember uh, she's in the middle of that picture, Alice Houston. Alice was born in Jersey City but called Monmouth County home for the past 65 years from Union Beach to Keyport to Hazlitt to Homedale. She was 73 years old and had been a resident of Homedale for the past 37 of those years. Throughout her career, Alice wore many hats. She worked for the Monmouth County Action Program in Asbury Park. That's a community service organization that served and empowered families in need across Monmouth County. She would serve as a supervisor and bookkeeper at the New Jersey Turnpike Authority. And after that, she worked alongside her husband, Jim, who's on her left there, uh, as he built his law practice in the Keyport and Hazlitt areas. And she was a top realtor along the Monmouth Bay Shore for more than 35 years. And I've heard from a lot of people about Alice. She was known and uh, beloved by many. But behind all of her energy, not surprising from that picture, was her family. She is survived by Jim, her husband, and their children, Michelle, Allie, and Christopher, and their families, including her seven grandchildren, and I think we got a lot of them right there, Madeline, Caitlin, Colton, Jake, Will, Sam, and Molly. I spoke with Jim and Alice's son-in-law, Paul, on Monday. What an incredible life she lived. Alice also leaves behind all nine of her siblings, which means she will also be missed by countless, not just siblings, but by nieces and nephews. For all she did for the communities in which she lived, we pray for God to bless Alice for a lifetime of good work and good deeds, and may God watch over her, her memory, and her incredible family. All three of those we remember today were cornerstones in their communities. May their legacies of service and caring for others be carried forward. Before we move on, I, I wish to note that FEMA has begun offering funeral cost reimbursements to financially help families who have lost a lo loved one to COVID-19. In general, applicants who lost someone to COVID-19 going back to the beginning of the pandemic may be eligible for $9,000 for any costs related to a funeral, as well as burial or cremation costs. I would encourage every impacted family to visit that website, disasterassistance.gov. That's disasterassistance.gov for more specific eligibility information for this financial assistance. Uh, and then to, a, to call 1-844-684-6333. That's 1-844-684-6333 to apply. It must be noted that applications for assistance are only being taken by telephone. Again, the website is to get information. You gotta use the phone number there to apply. We know how tough funeral expenses have been for many families already reeling from the economic impacts of the pandemic. And thankfully this help is available to you. Now, almost there, staying in the Monmouth County area, I wanna give a huge shout out to this guy, Chef Lou Smith, the owner and executive chef of Blend on Main in Manasquan and the founder of Chef Lou's Army, which has its reach uh, overwhelmingly into both Monmouth and Ocean Counties. Created after the pandemic hit, 
Sheflu's army has spent the past year providing free and nutritious meals, as I mentioned, to Monmouth and Ocean County families and seniors in need, along with the families of our health care workers and first responders. Over the course of last spring, Chef Lou's army cooked and delivered more than a thousand meals every day, every day. But Chef Lou and his army aren't done. And they've recently partnered with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority through the new Sustain and Serve NJ program to keep going. And with a $250,000 grant in hand, I know Chef Lou is ready to keep the Army going strong. I had the opportunity to check in with Chef Lou on Monday. We had a great call. I thanked him for all that he is doing. He is just a man who loves to cook and loves to feed those in need of a meal. Take a moment to visit him at ChefLou'sArmy.org. No apostrophe. ChefLou'sArmy.org or stop off and say hi next time you're in Manasquan. I also want to give this shout out. Lou's got a big fundraiser coming up on April 26th at the Manasquan River Golf Club. And importantly, he's doing it in combination with the organization A Need We Feed. And we have already acknowledged a need we feed in a prior press conference. So two of these great organizations, Chef Lou's Army and a need we feed, both of which are part of the New Jersey um, Sustain uh, Program, Sustain and Serve NJ uh, Program, are teaming up. And that fundraiser, again, is April 26, Manasquan River Golf Club. That same website, cheflouesarmy.org, has the details. And finally, today, I wish to acknowledge today's celebration in Israel and among our Jewish community of Yom Ha'atz Ma'ot, the day on the Hebrew calendar which corresponds to Israel's Independence Day in 1948. Ever since the founding of the State of Israel, which, by the way, President Harry Truman acknowledged 11 minutes after its founding, New Jersey has been a mutual partner in a close cultural and economic relationship. A driver of this relationship has been the New Jersey-Israel Commission, which was established in 1989. To coincide with today's celebration, I recommit New Jersey to our continued partnership with the State of Israel by naming the 76 public members of the New Jersey-Israel Commission, including the reappointment of dear friends co-chair Mark Levinson and the appointment of his new sister co-chair, another dear friend, Karen Elkis, among many others. And that list includes former Israeli ambassadors Danny Diane. And a dear, another dear friend, and Michael Oren. These members represent the true depth of the Jewish community in New Jersey, hailing from the worlds of business, journalism, music, diplomacy, government service, and community engagement, technology, medicine, academia, and many others. And we'll work alongside the Commission's outstanding Executive Director, Andrew Gross. I congratulate this entire extraordinary group, and I look forward to seeing all the common good that continues to flow from the New Jersey-Israel Commission. And with that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. Well, the Department understands that the pause in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has raised some concerns about receiving COVID-19 vaccine overall. It's important to remember that your risk of getting seriously ill or dying from COVID-19 is much greater than experiencing this extremely rare possible side effect that prompted the federal government out of an abundance of caution to pause J&J &J administration and take time to analyze the data. We have had no similar reports in New Jersey among those who have received the J&J &J vaccine. Additionally, uh, generally, the incidence of this type of thrombosis, this clot, without vaccination is also very rare. CDC reported uh, these blood clots have occurred in women between the ages of 18 and 48 with low blood platelet levels. Their symptoms developed six to 13 days after vaccination. In New Jersey, 47,266 women in that age group have received the J&J &J, uh, vaccine. Uh, but again, we have no similar reports. If you receive the J&J &J vaccine within the last three weeks, no matter your age, and you experience leg pain, abdominal discomfort or pain, shortness of breath, or a severe headache, please call your health care provider or go to the nearest hospital to be assessed. We are encouraging residents 
to keep their vaccine appointments for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, which have been demonstrated to be safe and effective. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccine use mRNA technology, which is different than the J&J vaccine. We understand that concerns about J&J may increase your hesitancy, but it is vital that as many people get vaccinated to beat COVID-19 in our state, where we have lost one in 500 New Jerseyans to this virus. We are concerned about the impact of the variants that are circulating in our state right now and the possibility of increased transmission as a result of the variants. So when individuals get vaccinated, it helps protect them, their loved ones, and their community. And millions of people in the United States have been vaccinated safely. This pause is a reflection of how seriously the federal government is taking the safety of vaccines. All vaccine sites in New Jersey have taken Johnson & Johnson vaccines, vaccine doses, out of inventory and will not use them until further federal guidance is provided. The department has requested that all vaccinators develop alternate plans for those affected by this pause in the use of J&J, including maintaining the existing J&J vials in appropriately, appropriately monitored storage conditions and ensure that they remain segregated at this point in time, but ready to be safely used when the pause is lifted. The state will not be receiving J&J &J until further notice. At this time, we don't know if we will be receiving uh, additional increases in Pfizer and Moderna doses beyond what is expected. Most sites get a mix of vaccine types, so many are able to switch to either Pfizer or Moderna for their appointments. For example, Hackensack Meridian Health announced that they wouldn't need to cancel any appointments at their vaccination sites, which includes Bergen County. It, it, it includes the Bergen County mega site, and would provide uh, their other Moderna and Pfizer vaccines in place of J&J. &J. There are no reported issues at the mega sites. Uh, for example, the Gloucester mega site will provide Pfizer in place of Johnson and Johnson. J&J vaccine was distributed uh, across a number of sites in categories such as the Federal Retail Pharmacy Partnership. That includes supermarket pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, some hospitals, some of the mega sites, county and local health departments, and additionally, Walmarts. Over the past two weeks, more than 146,000 doses of J&J &J were distributed to a variety of sites. We have received feedback that sites with Moderna or Pfizer have begun rescheduling those who were scheduled to receive J&J doses while the pause is in effect. The department is also reaching out to sites that only have J&J doses to provide assistance with communication to those affected by the pause, including, including options to schedule appointments at other locations. J&J only sites are not prepared to receive Moderna or Pfizer. The Department's Office of Local Health is contacting local health uh, officials to offer assistance due to, the, due to this pause. Many are working to accommodate those who were scheduled for J&J. &J. For example, both Monmouth and Ocean County Health Departments have indicated that they should have enough Moderna and Pfizer vaccines to offer it to those who were scheduled for the J&J &J vaccine and the Somerset County Health uh, um, Office will offer Moderna for those who were scheduled to receive J&J. &J. However, because of its ease of storage and the convenience of being one dose, we were using J&J &J for some specific populations that would benefit from a one dose regimen. So those persons will be impacted and may have to be rescheduled to alternate sites if that is possible. We recognize the challenges this pause creates, and we are committed to working alongside these partners to continue to advocate for vaccine supply for vulnerable and specific populations, and to ensure that adequate testing and assist with other COVID mitigation strategies are in place. We are talking with our partners serving these populations and looking at which sites may be able to accommodate Moderna vaccine, although it would be more complex to administer a two-dose vaccine for some of these special populations, 
If we need to go forward with a two-dose vaccine, we will work to do so because we are committed to an equitable, equitable access to this vaccine. As you know, CDC has convened an emergency meeting of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices today to further review these cases and assess potential implications on vaccine policy. So we look forward to receiving further guidance after their, their review of the data. Overall, more than 5.6 million doses of vaccine have been administered in the state, and more than 3.5 million individuals have received at least one dose of vaccine. So over time, we have been able to increase vaccination among our communities of color. Over the past month, the percentage of black, non-Hispanic residents with at least one dose rose from 5% to 8%. So we do have a way to go in that regard. However, over that same time period, the percent of Hispanic individuals moved from 7% on March 15th to 19% on April 15th, approximating their representation in our general population. The percentages of seniors vaccinated in the state also continues to rise. 80% of those individuals between the ages of 65 to 75 have received at least one dose. 75% of individuals 80 and older have received at least one dose. On to my daily report, as the governor mentioned, 2,281 individuals are in our hospitals. Our hospital census over the last seven days has stabilized somewhat. And as I mentioned on Monday, a large percentage of our hospitalizations are under the age of 60. Right now, about 49% of our admissions are under 60 years of age. In December, that percentage was approximately 35%. So we have seen a, a, a rise in those individuals being admitted to the hospital in the younger age cohorts, particularly those under 60, from 35% to 49%. There are a total of 1,160 report, 64 reports of CDC variants of concern in New Jersey. 1,130 of those reports are the UK variant B117. Additionally, our reports of the Brazilian variant P1 have risen to 19 total cases. Fortunately, there are no new reports of multisystem inflammatory syndrome uh, in children. Two of the children affected are, affected are still hospitalized. There are no new cases at our veterans' homes and our psych hospitals. Report one new case in a patient at Ann Klein. On April 10th, uh, Saturday, uh, New Jersey reports a percent positivity of 11.04. The northern part of the state is 10.95, central 10.93, and the southern part of the state 11.43. So that concludes my report. Stay safe, continue to mask up, socially distance, stay home when you're sick, get tested, get vaccinated, and remember for each other and for us all, please take the call and download the COVID Alert NJ app. Thank you. Judy, thank you. Two comments to underscore, one, one on age, one on equity. Uh, and I think you and Eddie would agree there's a correlation, strong correlation between the great progress we've made on vaccinating seniors on the one hand, mm -hmm. who we know are the most vulnerable, and the flip side of that coin is a younger demographic getting sick uh, yeah. in the hospital. And then on equity, great progress, although it's a journey. I think uh, African-American number was 8%. That's up against plus or minus 13% as a general population matter. Latino numbers are closer to the actual representation. The flip side of that on the bad news side, there's no question that Johnson & Johnson hiccup is a challenge, in particular on the equity piece. I would, I'm sure you would agree. So for instance, a homeless population, to pick that population, extremely vulnerable, among the most vulnerable, the notion of, and we'll do it if we have to, right? You said we will, if, if that's what it comes to, we'll do it. But the notion of cold chain storage, two appointments is really hard with uh, some of these 
hard to reach vulnerable population. So God willing, this review by the feds is a pace. It comes out with guidance that uh, we can live with and we get back to some rhythm on, uh, on that front. But for all the above, uh, many thanks. Pat, whether you got compliance, um, whether it looks like it's coming down on us a little bit, please help us out there. They used to be called dispatchers, but I think it's public safety telecommunicators week or month. Uh, either way, we take our hats off to them because they've been central players uh, in this pandemic fight. But any or, any or all of the above and whatever else you got, and let's keep recruiting candidates to become <laughs> state troopers. Thanks, Pat. Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, since we last met, we do have one EO compliance uh, citation that was issued. Uh, Haddon Township police responded to a landlord-tenant dispute. Uh, the tenant had her utility shut off and her belongings uh, out on her front lawn, which is in uh, violation of the executive order uh, protecting uh, those from illegal evictions, and the landlord was cited, Governor. Uh, with regards to um, the weather, we are expecting a serious amount of rain in the next couple of days, so we're keeping an eye on that. Uh, and I'm glad you brought up the public safety telecommunicators. Uh, it is their appreciation week. I've, I stopped up at the Rock Call Center yesterday to thank them personally. I was at Hamilton Dispatch Center. Uh, I'm going to hit Totowa tomorrow. Uh, they have been the lifeline for first responders and citizens for more than the past year. Uh, in the past year, over 240 million 911 calls alone across America, uh, and they do a, a phenomenal job. Uh, again, troop whether it's traffic accidents, calling in stops, 911 calls, motorist aids, a phenomenal group of women and men that uh, sometimes uh, they don't do it for the glory or for the uh, certainly for the recognition. But in this week, uh, we take the time to thank them for being that lifeline to the men and women who are our first responders and are certainly our citizens. And to your point, uh, nine days left in that application process. I was on with George Gore on the AG this morning on his radio show. Uh, it's a constant uh, push in these last nine days. So njtrooper.com is where all that information is in a time when uh, we know that there are women and men out there that want to step up and, and join us in this call to action and be part of, uh, of the next century of service. So thank you for that as well, Governor. That's all I have. Are, are you, rumor has it you may be on open line at one of my favorite stations, WBLS, on Sunday. Is that that right? is correct. 8 o'clock Sunday morning. I love we'll that. be on that again, uh, continuing the push for, please, uh, for the application process. Mateen and Jennifer and the whole team there are best. You know, folks who answer the phone, it, it, in this case specifically the public safety telecommunicators, but I'm thinking processing your unemployment uh, claim, your call center, how many calls a day are they fielding? 20,000? 20,000 calls a day are being answered by a live person on the call center. I mean, there are the, 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 uh, the FEMA support for funerals, which I just put up, and I made the note. You can go online to get the information, but you get a call. Somebody's on the other end. That's a federal program, obviously. Um, but it has been the glue. How many 911 did you say? 240 million? Yes, sir. 240 million calls in the just country. Staggering. Wow. It's absolutely staggering. So thank you for all, all of the above. And by the way, please, folks, this has rarely happened, but landlords cannot throw folks out on the street. Uh, there's a moratorium in place. Uh, please, I know most everyone is abiding by that, including landlords who themselves are suffering. We've got a landlord assistance program in place for a reason. We, we, we completely get that, but there cannot be unilateral action that, that takes a home from out, out from under somebody. Again, we're going to be um, virtual tomorrow. I know I've got an event tomorrow that's not sp uh, specific to COVID, but perhaps we'll have COVID numbers. Friday we'll be on the road somewhere, but we'll, we'll continue with the rhythm we've had of late, uh, and then we'll be virtual over the weekend. And uh, Unless you hear otherwise, we'll be back with you right here uh, Monday at 1 o'clock. So with that, Dante's got the mic. Matt, we'll start with you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Commissioner, are you able to be more specific on how the state uh, plans to get vaccines to people who are homebound and in difficult areas of community uh, to get these shots uh, without J&J? &J? I know you touched on it a little bit, but just curious about the specifics. And are any of the vaccination sites tapping into any Pfizer or Moderna second dose reserves to meet the sudden schedule changes? And lastly, Governor, 34 undocumented immigrants are on day eight of their hunger strike, and they say they're going to keep on going until there's a commitment 
from your office to help extend um, to help excluded workers. Excuse me. Have you revisited using CRF funds like other states? Or are you looking at using American Rescue Plan money? Also, have there been any updated ongoing talks with the legislature about stimulus checks or uh, unemployment payments for undocumented immigrants? Judy, I'll start and, and throw it over to you. I think I predict you're going to say it is to be determined, given we just heard this yesterday in terms of how we deal with homebound, homeless folks that are hard to reach. But any thoughts you've got? To the best of my knowledge, we're not dipping into the second dose supplies, uh, but Judy can correct me if I'm wrong. And again, our hearts are broken at anyone who finds it necessary to be on a hunger strike. So please, God, know that we uh, care deeply about this. And we, we are trying very much, if not desperately, to find a good solution here. And I'm confident we will find something. There was a meeting I know with some of the representatives of advocates with some members of our team yesterday. Paramel, you were a part of that, I know. Um, the, the, we're looking at all the above. Uh, CRF, more likely ARP money, American Rescue Plan money. Um, and, and again, it's because we want to do right by every single human being, but it's also because uh, unless we care for all of us in the state, not some of us or not most of us, but all of us, unless we bring all of us along, we will not find our way through this uh, challenging journey. So to be determined in terms of what that actually looks like. Judy, any comment on um, hard to reach folks that otherwise would have, where we would have used J&J &J and or preservation of the second dose? Sure. Let's talk about the second dose first. We, we've asked everyone to make sure that they put aside their second dose um, so that um, we don't complicate the problem. Uh, we do a count of inventory, how many doses are on the shelf uh, every single day. And we expect that all doses be moved within seven days and that there's no more than a three-week inventory on the shelf. We are moving that guideline down to two weeks and encouraging all sites to use as many first doses as possible to make up for the scheduled appointments that had to be paused. We also, and that's the analytics and allocation team. We also have a team that just looks at vulnerable populations. Uh, they will be meeting going forward uh, after we hear what uh, ASAP has to say today. They will be meeting to make alternative arrangements for those hard to reach uh, uh, populations. Uh, it will be um, somewhat complex because of the uh, reporting and monitoring and follow-up for the second dose. But if we have to do that, we will do it. Something just happened. Something happened to Judy's mic there. So if you could make sure we're still plugged in. Judy, can you say something else again? Do you mind? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, there you go. You're back. You're back. <laughs> Sometimes you hear you. I meant to say one other point. We had a meeting with uh, some leading both uh, representatives from the Assembly and a separate one with the Senate. And I want to give Senator Ruiz a shout out on, to your last question about trying to find uh, legislative or other means by which we can get money uh, to this, this, the uh, undocumented population. I, again, she deserves a shout out because she was, she's a leader on this and she was extremely passionate about it. Thank you. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon. For Dr. Bresnitz, since students, schools, and children didn't end up being the virus vectors that we feared, was it a mistake to close schools down and send kids into remote learning for as long as we have? For the commissioner, you mentioned the homeless population. Can you tell us some other populations that were being uh, given the J&J &J dose and how the progress in that area is affected by the pause? And for the governor, uh, teachers unions in Trenton are resistant to Mayor Reed Gassiora's plans to reopen schools for in-person learning, partial in-person learning on May 3rd. They say that sending students back into the classrooms for six or seven weeks, two hours a day, or four hours a day, two days a week, I should say, is not going to help with learning. The mayor says this is necessary for basically a shakedown for September. What's your view? Who's right there? And lastly, when do you foresee yourself rescinding the state of emergency or the public health emergency? What level do we need to be at? Does the RT need to be at zero? Do we need to be at zero cases? Because in theory, if coronavirus continues, perhaps even becomes a seasonal illness, you could govern under executive order, in theory, for your entire term in office. Thank you for that, Alex. Eddie, I'm going to take this one for you. Um, with all due respect, uh, we, we got clobbered by something none of us had any history with, limited knowledge at best, 
no capacities, no sense of which habits worked. You make the best decisions at the moment in time. You make those decisions based on the information you've got. I'll let Judy come back to other populations other than homeless. I don't have insight in the particulars of the Trenton situation, so I'll, Mahan, I'll come back to Alex on that if we, if we could. I, I speak regularly to mayors, superintendents, uh, teachers, uh, union leadership in communities, which I do almost daily. I was actually on with the leadership of the NJEA this morning, not specific to Trenton. Obviously, our mantra from day one has been uh, we need to do it safely and responsibly, but we want to get kids and educators back in the classroom uh, because we know the educational experience is dramatically richer when it's face to face. Um, I promise you we will not keep the state of emergency or the health care emergency on the books for one minute longer than it needs to be. Uh, it just is not something that, that we relish. It's not something that we want to be doing. It, we do it because we have to do it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a topic of constant con conversation on, on, within our team, with our legislative colleagues, and they've been great about that, um, obviously with members of the press. Um, you don't hear it from the man on the street hardly at all. Um, frankly, that's not a, they're, they're much more focused on somebody's died in their family or sick or they've lost their job or they've lost their business and they want to know what we're doing for them. And those state, the, the, both of those, the health care emergency and the state of emergency allows us to do a lot more than we normally could for those people. Um, and what do we need to see? I don't, I don't have a, a very cr specific, this number gets from Y to Z. We'll do it, but we will not hold on to this one minute longer than we have to. It's just not, it's, we, don't, we don't have any more joy in this being the case than anyone else does. Judy, what else other than um, homeless populations? Um, we've looked at um, home, the homebound uh, population, individuals that uh, do not have a car, where transportation even to, to a site that may be five or 10 miles away would be uh, difficult. Uh, seasonal workers or migrant workers who we know are in the state right now. Uh, many of these, by the way, those, the vaccination programs had already started. So a percentage of this group have already been vaccinated primarily by J&J uh, &J without any adverse uh, effects. Um, major senior centers, um, again, where transportation or that we'd be putting them more at risk if they were put on a, a bus in close contact with one another to move to a site. Um, so the, the team that we have working on this is, uh, ide has identified every single population, about 30 different specific populations uh, in New Jersey, and then they're identifying and, or have identified plans for each of the groups. So the, these are the types of the, that come to mind right now. And, and Judy, as, we, as you said and as I underscored, it's not like we won't be able, that we won't get to them. We will get to them. It's just going to be more complicated, and it's going to take longer. And God willing, listen, there's no, there's no evidence, and I'm gonna, I'm, I am going to pull Eddie out of the bullpen in a minute here, so bear with me, Eddie. We've we got to give you your money's worth. You're not here for the next few weeks, am I right? So, so we've got to make sure we make this one count. Um, but one, op, one outcome here is that J&J &J gets put back on the boards, right? I mean, there's, clearly that is a possibility, and or it gets put back on the boards with some caveats in terms of who should be uh, taking it. AstraZeneca is exactly that in Europe right now. Uh, they've, uh, they've emphasized seniors for AstraZeneca, not young persons. You could see something like that here. And even, sir, you got something? You're good? Okay, I'm going to slip you 20. Thank you. Uh, Dave, how are you? you could, you're welcome to say you've got nothing either, no? No, I do have something, <laughs> but I would also in, like the 20 if possible. <laughs> um, Can't have it both ways, my friend. Um, to get Dr. Bresnitz out of the bullpen, um, could you speak, doctor, on um, the vaccine and medication history that we have in you know, recent times, do they always, after they go onto the market, um, are they always problem free or do we sometimes see pauses similar to what we've seen with the J&J &J vaccine pause? Um, how significant is this um, that the CDC is meeting so quickly at the advisory committee today? And when do you think we would get some kind of guidance about um, what they're going to decide and, and how will, what kinds of things will they look at? I mean, we, we know some statistics about these individuals that have had the blood clots, but how deeply do they go into this and, and how do they figure this stuff out? Governor, um, 
you've mentioned that, you know, obviously we want to try to encourage people, especially in minority communities, to not be afraid to get vaccinated uh, because of this pause. So what's your thinking on what needs to be done? How are we going to really encourage these people? Um, again, because of the history of the way this has played out in this country. And um, Commissioner, how many appointments do we have a sense have been canceled? And how many have been rescheduled? And, and how is this working? When somebody gets a canceled appointment, do, do they go to the back of the line? Or um, are they helped right away and they're fit in? Um, how is this whole system working? And just, Commissioner, if you'd be kind enough to give clarification, you'd given some data on the percentage of blacks. I think you said 8%. Uh, we're up to 8% now have been vaccinated. Is that 8% of the total population of New Jersey? Or is it of 8% of blacks that have now been vaccinated that live in New Jersey? That's it. Thank you very much. Um, Dave, I'll start and then turn it to both Eddie and Judy. Uh, I'll start with the last one. That's 8% of the total population with a representation of approximately 13% of the Af African-American community. So we are 8 thirteenths of the way there, if you will. The Latino number is within a point or two of being all, all, all the way there. So, um, again, good progress, but we know we remain on a journey. Um, I want to add to your questions of Eddie, how common is it to see pauses? I think, Eddie, the, you're going to say the answer is it is common, but I'll let Eddie answer that. How significant is it that they're meeting today? What sorts of stuff are they going to look like? And when do we expect to hear? I'm anxious to hear the answers to that as well. I'd also, Eddie, uh, it was described the the um, the challenges of the six women as they were described to me yesterday. Uh, it was described as quite unique to have a blood clotting experience, and I'd love you to react to that. And before I hand things over to you and Judy, um, I, I continue to be confident not just in the Moderna Pfizer supply, but I continue to be confident in the system in the following sense. Regardless of where the CDC and the independent authorization committees come out, that, that the guidance will be guidance that we can take to the bank, um, including if that guidance suggests that J&J &J is back to being okay as a general matter to use and or it is okay for a particular part of our population to use. But we want to reiterate in terms of the efficacy, putting aside these six cases which everyone is taking very seriously, the efficacy against hospitalization, severe illness, death, all three of these vaccines are money good. Uh, and folks need to, to, to continue to hear that. Judy, should we go to Eddie first and then back to you on uh, the, how the appointment situations work? Eddie, good to have you. Same here. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Governor. And thanks for those questions. There are several of them there. Uh, I'm going to focus on um, your question. I'm um, looking at mostly vaccines, although I can say for medications, uh, it's the same thing when they do clinical trials and then post licensure, usually it's licensure, then, you know, they're continually monitoring the safety of the, um, of the product. But for vaccines, I want to divide it into those, um, what happens during a phase three trial and what happens after authorization or, or licensure. And we had the experience of a pause with one of the phase three trials with AstraZeneca. They had this transverse myelitis. They paused the trial, um, as I believe, for a few weeks. And then they restarted it after they looked at the data and they felt that, in fact, there was an association. There was not an association between um, the use of the vaccine and this particular um, um, disease. Um, and then, of course, those phase three trials occur only in maybe 20,000 or so individuals, so any rarer event is unlikely to manifest itself in a small, a small trial. And so um, with these vaccines, with the three that we had, including the J&J, &J, the FDA um, assessed and their and advisor committees assessed that the benefits outweighed the risk and they authorized their use. It's not surprising that when you put these vaccines into tens, uh, millions of individuals that you're going to find a rarer um, effect. And I think the commissioner said that, that the data, or maybe the governor said, was about one in a million for these six women um, in, in the U.S. who've had this um, un unfortunate uh, experience. Um, AstraZeneca also in Europe has had similar experience. And reading the two articles that were just published in the New England Journal describing those um, 
those cases, one came out of Norway, the other came out of Germany and Austria, it sounds like the same um, impact, the same uh, of the vaccines. And as you know, the AstraZeneca and the and the um, J and J vaccine are the same platform, so it, there's a, you know clearly a similarity today. And so, although it happens, um, it's 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 done because out of the term that's often used is the abundance of caution. But really, it's about transparency and about make, making sure um, that the public understands that everyone is watching, particularly when you have unlicensed vaccines that we're looking to see whether there's these rare events and we're going to assess whether these are real associations, causal association, and then whether the benefit outweighs the risk in, in continued use of these vaccines. I can't tell you what the ACIP is going to recommend today. I think, Governor, you're probably on the mark. I, I, if I had to bet on it, I would think that they're going to recommend um, continued use, maybe after a little bit more time, but maybe in a select population. But We'll see what they're going to do today at the ACIP is they're going to review all the data. Uh, the manufacturer will probably present the details of those six cases, um, of those six cases. They'll probably review some of the AstraZeneca data too because of the similarity. Um, there'll be some risk benefit analysis and they'll look at other databases to see whether there are other um, cases that have been missed and that's what they're going to be looking for. Are there other cases other than these six cases that we perhaps need to look at as well? And, um, and of course, they've had a very intensive safety monitoring uh, process for the COVID-19 vaccines, and the committee or the, in, the CDC point person will be presenting the data uh, from the work group that was established just to monitor safety for the COVID-19 uh, vaccine program. And um, I would expect that the C, as I said, the ACIPs are probably, they're not going to walk out of the room today without providing some guidance. The, the public is expecting guidance. There's the pressure of the continuing pandemic with lots of cases around the country and people are wanting to know can we put forward the vaccine even though there's we have these rare events or do we go and just use the two dose vaccines that we currently have I and mean, that's a big decision that needs to be made but it needs to be made quickly Eddie um, well said uh, on all um, the immediacy of this I think gets to the point on transparency let's 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 be right up front about this, right? And I think that should give people comfort that actually they're dealing with this on an expedited basis. Um, thank you for all of that. V very helpful. Judy, any, any color on if I got my appointment canceled, how am I going to know? What am I going to do? Uh, back of the line, et cetera. Uh, to the first part of the question, we know this week we received 15,600 doses of J&J. Uh, &J. So not all of them are immediately um, appointed. In, in other words, I haven't um, made all those appointments. So some percentage of that had to be um, rescheduled, and the rescheduling will take place through the local point of dispensing, uh, through the local site, um, with the help of our call center, um, if needed. Um, right now, most of the sites are, the large sites are keeping the appointments and um, filling them with Moderna or Pfizer. Again, that's, I'm sure that's not going to be that you all won't hear that, hey, I, I don't know, that somewhere, somewhere in the system, this is, a, this is a bump in the road, and we'll do everything we can to make sure folks um, get whole again in terms of appointments. Thank you both for that. Thank you, Dave. Nikita, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any plans to impose or loosen restrictions on beaches, amusement parks, or arcades in anticipation of the summer tourism season? And with the Gateway Environmental Review due to be completed in May, I'm wondering if you expect a groundbreaking sometime this year. And then I asked you about this last week, but the Senate has now scheduled a quorum for the 19th, so I want to know if you expect to conditionally veto the mandatory minimums bill within the next five days. And then finally, uh, Democratic Governors Association Chair Michelle Luan Grisham has settled a lawsuit brought by a former staffer who accused her of groping his genitals. Uh, I'm wondering if you believe that she should resign. Uh, when you go off topic, you go off topic. Let there be no doubt about that. Uh, uh, no news on beaches, amusement parks, or arcades, but um, I, would sus I would expect 
they will be on a list of guidance that we'll be providing as we turn toward the summer season. I assume Paramount will agree with that. Um, not sure I'm groundbreaking on Gateway, but uh, it's going in the right direction in a big way, and that's really good. The Portal North Bridge is, is ahead of it because we got the green light out of President Trump in June. So my guess is if we're thinking about putting a shovel in the ground, it may well happen at Portal North Bridge beforehand. Nothing new on mandatory minimums, although I, I note the same as you did, that the Senate has called a quorum for, um, for Monday. Uh, and I think uh, Governor Lujan Grisham is doing a great job running the DGA. I'm its finance chair, so I don't make the, uh, the, the uh, jurisdictional decisions any longer as I did when I was chair, but um, I think she's doing a great job. And New Mexico, I think, is doing a very good job um, uh, in the pandemic more generally. She's, by the way, the former health commissioner, Judy. Don't get any ideas. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks to everybody. Um, very helpful discussion. Eddie, we'll, we won't see you for a few. Keep us, keep us in your prayers and in mind. I will be in touch. My, my commitment is when you come back, by the time you're back here, we have a quantum, quantum meaningfully uh, improvement in the pandemic between be, today and then. There'll be nothing for me to say. There'll be nothing for you to say. Um, you can uh, come in and help Pat out with the weather. Uh, but Judy, to you and Eddie, thank you. And again, Eddie, we'll miss you, but best of luck to you, Pat, Jared, Paramel, to everybody. Again, folks, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we're getting there. The J&J &J vaccine thing is a bump on the road. It's not the first bump on the road. Let's remember that. And I think you all have done an extraordinary job uh, reacting to bumps in the road. Um, and I just know New Jersey well enough to know that you all and we all together will react well and figure out this uh, minor setback and get us to a get us back on track and get us to the point that we know we want to get to, which is to your question, Nikita a Jersey Shore summer, a summer in our lakes uh, that we all will relish and remember forever in the best sense. Um, and secondly, getting 4.7 million adult New Jerseyans vaccinated by the end of June. We are committed to both. God bless you all. Thank you.